Welcome to my presentation on microplastic transport between land and sea. My name is Sarah Peel and I'm working in the Coastal and Marine Management Group at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Warnemünde, Germany. Within this video lecture, I will provide you an overview about major land-based microplastic sources, its distribution on land and its transport via rivers into the oceans. Moreover, I will show you some mechanisms for microplastic retentions within rivers and transitional waters. So let's start with a short introduction into the topic. Microplastic is one category of plastic litter and defined as synthetic polymer particles less than five millimeter in size. The lower size limit is commonly agreed to be one micrometer, but depends on the sampling and analysis methods. Depending on their origin, microplastics are broadly categorized in two categories. Primary microplastics are intentionally produced within the size range to be applied in a wide range of applications, as for example, microbeads in cosmetic products. Through biological, chemical or physical processes, Larger plastic litter is slowly degrading in the environment and leads to so-called microplastics of secondary origin. So microplastic constitutes not only a single material with defined properties, but a diverse mix of items differing in polymer type, density, shape, size, and chemical composition. Moreover, the efforts and costs for sampling, sample analysis, and sample preparation are still high and require chemical characterization with advanced technologies. So the highly variable properties of microplastics and the lack of standardized methods make sampling and analysis and therewith comparisons among studies difficult, as well as lead to a wide variety of distribution in the environment and interactions of microplastics with the environment and organisms. Although harmful effects are controversially discussed, due to their small size, microplastic has a higher potential to be ingested by a wider range of organisms, including us humans. So microplastic poses a potential risk for human health and is perceived as an environmental hazard. As a result, there is a great interest to understand the extent of the contamination, its sources, its distribution, transport, and accumulation in the environment. But what is known about microplastics in the environment? Sea bottom sediments have largely been proposed as final sinks. This is reasonable, considering that most microplastic is produced and consumed on land, and like sediments in the water cycle, is transported via rivers into the oceans. The extent to which rivers may act as a sink for microplastic is subject of current research. The role of atmospheric transport has only recently gained attention and is not further discussed here. But particles in the lower microplastic range and nanometer range, it is thought to be important for long distance transport. So let's start with a look at the sources on land. Within this figure, the global leakage of micro and microplastic to the environment is shown, which was estimated to be 22 million tons in 2019. One major emission route for plastic on land is mismanaged waste and unintentional or intentional littering. Here, illegal dumping from, uh, or spills from industrial sites, open air events such as New Year's Eve, or even abundant litter from barbecues in summer can play an important role. Now focusing only on the highlighted microplastic numbers, the following fragmentation of this litter contributes to about 25% of all microplastic inputs to the environment. Another 25% is coming from road transport, with tire operation accounting by far most of this, but also including road markings or brake wear. About 20% is so-called microplastic city dust from the operation of shoe soles, paint wear from surfaces, or losses from construction activities 
and household textile dust. Accidental losses of primary pellets, abrasion of artificial turf, losses of synthetic fibers, and microbeads in cosmetic products play a less important role. Additional large quantities can enter the environment through sewage sludge when it is applied to farmlands with another share of about 20%. For the latter, the reason is that wastewater treatment plants are very effective and filter out more than 90% of the microplastics in the wastewater. If applied as agricultural fertilizer, this microplastic retained during wastewater tre treatment can enter farmlands. It has been shown that sewage sludge has high levels of microplastics and that soil contamination increases with increasing number of sewage sludge applications. But in future, restrictions in the use of sewage sludge as fertilizer will reduce microplastic inputs via this pathway in Germany. In contrast, microplastic concentrations in compost is thought to be an order of magnitude lower than in sewage sludge. Nevertheless, organic fertilizer from bio-waste digestion and composting can be a significant source as well, depending on the organic waste the plants receive. For example, higher microplastic concentrations are found in compost, which come from plants receiving their organic waste from private households or the industry. Here, a study further showed that the material, the microplastics, consists of polymer types, which are primarily used for consumer products and packaging products, revealing myth throws of plastics into the bio-waste as a major problem. In Germany, microplastic containing fertilizer is thought to be responsible for 51% of plastic inputs to farmlands. Microplastic coming from the pelleting of seeds, soil conditioners, or crop protection is thought to contribute to another 15%. Considering larger plastic, littering is estimated to contribute to another 30%, and 4% are estimated to come from the fragmentation of so-called agricultural plastic applications, as for example, mulching films, shown in the picture on, in the slide. So, as can be seen, farmland is brown to microplastic contamination, whereas for other land use categories, only limited data or non-data exists, as for example, forests or grassland but it's commonly agreed that the pollution level is lower in these areas. Higher concentration of microplastics in soils are found close to urban sites as compared to rural sites, with on average about an order of magnitude higher concentrations in urban areas. Extreme values are found close to industrial sites and exceed common concentrations about two to four orders of magnitude. To conclude, there is a positive relationship between population density and microplastic concentration in soils. Moreover, land use influences the level of microplastic pollution on land. The figure shows sources of microplastic and processes that influence its emission to and distribution within rivers. On the right side of the figure, the input and transport pathways on vegetation areas are summarized. Urban inputs and pathways are shown to the left of the river. Talking only about freshwater systems, the importance of microplastic transport via wind and atmospheric deposition, as well as through soils via groundwater emission, is estimated to be low. Transport of microplastic is likely to take place over the soil surface due to precipitation induced runoff and water erosion. Here, population density and degree of urbanization play again an important role. Considering land use, the majority of studies report either no relationship or a negative relationship between agricultural land cover and microplastic pollution in rivers. In contrast, a strong relationship with urban areas is reported. 
Overall, for rivers, waterborne emissions from urban areas with a high degree of sealed surfaces are the most important source for microplastic in rivers. So let's take a look at the major transport pathways from an urban area to a river, the city sewer system. In general, there are two types of wastewater treatment systems, separated and combined systems. In a combined system, stormwater from streets and wastewater from households or the industry are normally both directed to the wastewater treatment plant, treated and then discharged into a river, as shown by the yellow arrows. Nevertheless, during heavy rain events, the capacity of a wastewater treatment plant can be exceeded and stormwater runoff together with wastewater enters the rivers directly without any previous treatment as so-called combined sewage overflows, as shown by the black arrows in the picture. In contrast, in separated systems, stormwater is treated in separate pipes and also sometimes retention structures exist and most times stormwater from street runoff is directly discharged into a river as shown on the left side of the figure. But in this system, wastewater from households and industry is always routed to the wastewater treatment plant and treated before being discharged into a river. To estimate the contribution of city sewer system pathways in relation to microplastic emissions to a water body, we did a case study. Therefore, we estimated microplastic emissions from the Rostock city sewer system to the Wano estuary in northeastern Germany. The outlet of the wastewater treatment plant is shown in the map by a red triangle. Combined sewer overflow outlets by orange symbols and stormwater outlets by black symbols. Within the study, we used own measurements, literature data, and GIS analysis, and found that the majority of microplastic emissions came from stormwater runoff with about 43% of share, followed by combined sewer overflows with a share of 6%. Emissions by the wastewater treatment plant, so treated wastewater had only a minor share, below 2%, which indicates that microplastic mitigation measures should focus on combined sewer overflows and stormwater emissions. Another interesting result of the study was that about 50% of the emissions came from each, the city and the Wano catchment area, while both having the same number of inhabitants. This could indicate that retention within the river could only have played a minor role in this study and considering the investigated timescale of one year. Since the transport of microplastics between land and sea is mainly via rivers, one of the most discussed issues in microplastic research is the retention capacity of microplastic in rivers. In principle, Microplastic can be deposited during low flow conditions and remobilized again during high flow conditions. Flow conditions are influenced by meteorological, hydrological factors and geomorphology of the river. At the end, the major question is if retention of microplastic is rather temporary or permanent. Unless rivers pass through lakes, major wetlands, reservoirs, or artificial structures, microplastic retention is presumably temporary. Long-term retention of microplastic particles within the river itself may happen if particles are deposited and transferred to deeper sediment layers within the river. So the retention of microplastics possibly greatly varies between different river systems and may be in the range of 0 to 100%. In this figure, processes and mechanisms that control the deposition and transfer of microplastics from the surface flow into streambed sediments are shown. 
Sedimentation and burial of microplastics, number two in the figure, is the most obvious mechanism leading to translocation of microplastics from the stream to the riverbed sediments. Sedimentation can also affect floating microplastics after density increasing processes such as aggregation, interaction with organisms or biofouling, as indicated by numbers four, five and six. Recent research has focused on the hyperreic zone as a potential sink for microplastics. It is the area of the riverbed that is equally influenced by surface and ground water flow dynamics. Transfer of particles across the streambed interface due to hyperreic exchange, number seven in the figure, is a transfer mechanism for microplastic that does not exceed the average pore size of the stream material, the space between the sediment grains, which in the case of this study was below 50 micrometer. In summary, one can say that for sedimentation and transfer to the streambed sediments and thus retention capacity, major influencing factors are particle properties such as density, shape or size, and particle interactions influencing their density. Further, hydrometeorological factors influence the flow conditions and streambed material influences the sediment pore size of the particles. Likewise to rivers, there's a lack of information on the retention capacity in the transitional zone between freshwater and marine waters, generally termed as estuaries. In contrast to freshwaters or rivers in estuaries, there is an inflowing saltwater as well as freshwater discharge, which is leading to, for example, differing salt concentrations, flow direction or flow velocities. In our study system, the Vano estuary, there are several factors which promote a deposition of particles. For example, sinking particles are predominantly directed landwards with a high saline bottom water, and in the city area, flow velocities are decreased, which promote a sinking or a deposition of particles. To estimate retention within the estuary, we made several assumptions. First, we grouped microplastic emissions according to their relative share for each emission source into a high and low density class. For the low density class, the floating particles, we assumed a retention of 31% as reported for suspended material in the estuary to account for density changing processes. For sinking particles, we assumed that they were completely retained. Utilizing this approach, we could provide a range of microplastic emissions from the estuary to the coast, while utilizing the retention scenario would cut the emissions to the coast by half. Estimates based on assumptions are only as good as the underlying information, but there are only few measurements which hamper a calculation of retention in estuaries. So how can retention be studied? In the Chesapeake Bay in the US, a hydrodynamic model coupled with a particle tracking model was utilized to simulate the transport and distribution of microplastics in the estuary. River emissions served as input for the model. The names on the map in the left indicate the considered river emissions for microplastic. The bars on the right map show the beach particles after one year of simulation. According to the model results, Right after emission, most of the microplastic particles are washed ashore within a few weeks and about 90% of the microplastics were retained in the estuary. Particle density influenced the distribution, while floating particles were more mobile, being in the seaward flowing surface waters. In contrast, sinking particles were washed ashore close to their emission source because of being in the bottom water flowing landwards. Further simulations with different particle sizes further showed that particle size had no influence and in distribution patterns. The results of the study are supported by another study in the Baltic Sea, a semi-enclosed sea in northeastern Europe, which can be seen as a large estuary being influenced by saltwater intrusion 
and freshwater discharges. The map on the slide shows the microplastic beached after one year of simulation on a logarithmic scale from low concentrations in blue to high concentrations in red. In this study, study as well, microplastic were washed ashore short after the mission a few kilometers around their emission point, as indicated by the red arrows for the seven largest rivers in the Baltic Sea. Likewise, to the study in the Chesapeake Bay, particle size had no influence on distribution, so did particle shape in this study. Overall, scenario simulations can help to identify important factors which influence the distribution and transport of microplastics. But more importantly, esteries have long been recognized as filters for land-derived materials such as carbon, sediments or nutrients, and likewise could be an important retention unit for microplastics coming from rivers. But what is the role of esterine filters on a global scale? This map shows different coastal types. The estuaries were classified according to their filtering capacity for riverine, suspended and solid materials. And active filters are shown in the red box with small deltas, tidal systems, lagoons and fjords. Three other types were classified as inactive filters, shown by the yellow, purple and gray line. The authors calculated that estuarine filters account for about 88% of the global coastline, while only 12% are classified as inactive nearshore filters. Further, the authors calculated that about 60% of river water and about 70% of sediment discharge to the oceans pass through estuarine filters. Which could explain why calculated global microplastic emissions into the oceans and calculated concentrations within the oceans do not match. Likewise, retention in rivers could be another possible explanation for this mismatch. At this point, I would like to summarize what we've learned. Microplastic pollution in soils is increasing with increasing population density and influenced by land use. Especially industrial sites, urban areas and farmland have high microplastic loads. For soils, littering and agricultural practices are a major source for microplastic for rivers, waterborne emissions from urban areas are the most important source. Here, city sewer systems play a dominant role with combined sewer overflows and stormwater emissions being the most significant input pathway, while treated wastewater plays only a minor role. We know that rivers play a key role in the transportation of microplastics from a catchment area to the marine environment, but the influence of retention cannot be estimated at present and varies strongly between rivers from about possibly zero to 100%. Likewise, estuaries can serve as an effective sink and retention unit for microplastics. The role of estuaries as filter for microplastics into the ocean needs to be clarified considering that estuarine filters account for about 88% of the global coastline. And with this short summary, I will bring my presentation to a close and thank you for your attention. <laughs>